Hello. Um, Hello. To this conversation on social innovation. On social innovation, uh, the power of gastronomy to transform social realities. And my name is Ana Botero, and I work at CAF as director of social innovation. Uh, recently, social innovation is a subject that has caught the attention of many mainstream organizations. And CAF is no exception. We are convinced that social innovation is a powerful tool for the enhancement of sustainable development in the region. Of course, we might not be innovators ourselves, or we do not pretend to be, but we certainly have a unique opportunity as a multilateral bank to act as enablers of social innovation. Uh, some of you might remember that two years ago, we came here and we brought uh, business leaders and social innovators, people that are taking creative action in solving social problems. Amongst them were the uh, B Corporations Movement, a movement that uses market forces to create social and environmental value. This time, we have another great opportunity. Uh, we brought three world-class entrepreneurs, three very powerful uh, change makers, Suito Esteves, uh, Michelangelo Cestari, and Brian McNair, three leading chefs of the Americas. They all combine innovation, inspiration, creativity, opportunity, resourcefulness, social purpose, in making real a common vision. The use of gastronomy and local-based cuisine as a force for good, as a leverage for development and value creation in several fronts. First, as an innovative instrument for social inclusion and job creation in villages and communities. Second, as a means of education, culinary training, and the promotion of healthy lifestyles. Third, as a way to activate local act, uh, artisan production, including tourism, and bringing back to the customer experience, tradition, and of course, taste. Fourth, as a way to rescue culture and tradition. And last but not least, as a way to promote social capital and intangibles, such as identity, pride, self-esteem. In Bolivia, one of the most interesting biodiversities in the world, we are currently working with Michelangelo through Manca Culinary School that provides education to socially disadvantaged Bol Bolivian youngsters. In uh, Venezuela, in Margarita, uh, an island of endless beauty, light and color, we partner with Sumito uh, in the construction of a local economic model based on popular uh, culture and tradition. And with Brian, uh, who leads World Central Kitchen in Haiti, well, we don't partner as yet, and I do hope to solve this problem very soon. Uh, his work in Haiti empowers communities throughout the country on the smart solutions to hunger. Uh, Sumito, Michelangelo, Brian, many thanks for being here and, and welcome. I'd like to start this conversation by posing the same question to the three of you. And share with me and with the audience, what is, it, what is exactly when you talk about uh, the power of food changing the world, or changing the world through the power of food? What exactly do you mean by that? Brian, if you may start. Five minutes, right? Five minutes, yes. Well, it should be easy because um, Spanish and Portuguese is much more beautiful than English, but English kind of gets to the point, so I should, I should be quick. Can you hear me? So um, I'm Brian McNair. I run an NGO called World Central Kitchen, founded by Chef Jose Andres, who, um, if you're from this town, you probably know of him, or maybe if from the U.S., you probably know of him. Um, and he and I partnered and started this three or four years ago, and funny enough, Jose's for-profit company, Think Food Group, says their slogan is, we use food as, to change the world. I mean, that is the slogan that they use. So the nonprofit does the same. We look for smart solutions to hunger and poverty, and we believe that food is at the center of it all. Um, one of the quotes that Jose always uses is from a uh, Briat Saurin, who is a um, a gastronome and a, and a philosopher, he always says that the, uh, the future of a nation depends on how it feeds itself. And I think if we all look at everything, I mean, there's, there's a lot of interesting topics talked about here today and a lot, a lot of really big thinking. But you know, food and feeding 
kitchens and cooking and cooks and, 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 and chefs, they're at the center of it all. We have to feed our communities. We have to feed them healthy. Um, this morning I heard some really interesting topics about uh, uh, the strength of Latin America um, that really st stuck out to me. Elevating millions of people out of poverty. Um, strengthening internally, strengthening countries internally through, uh, without being reliant on import-export or without being reliant on the, uh, the rates, uh, they go up and down, the interest rates. Um, and even technology. You know, these are th some of the things that really stuck out to me this morning. And you really, honestly, the, 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 the whole culinary world and chefs and cooks, we're at the center of this all. Um, in, with World Central Kitchen alone, we are actually in the middle of um, building school kitchens all around Haiti. We're not just Haiti. We're actually in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Zambia, Africa, and hopefully soon Cuba. But... Um, we are basically an NGO of chefs, and we have 70 chefs that are ready, willing, and able to go around the world. But we look at how we change the world through food, and l literally just changing these school kitchens and building school kitchens, as you know, education is so important to development. A meal can be the impetus to have a child in school or not. And then clean cooking on top of that is, is, is a whole health issue. Um, looking at products and how people produce products um, and, and getting those products to market. You know, there's a lot of great projects in agriculture around the world. Sometimes there's not a chef involved to connect them to the kitchens. I heard a really interesting thing on NPR this morning. It's actually happening in Florida. There's a problem with wild boar that are, that are uh, messing up and destroying the cattle farms. Well, the chefs came to the cattle farmers and said, we love that boar, we'll take it. So now the chefs are using wild boar in their meals and it's a delicacy. But this kind of look at how to use food through a chef's eyes, there's a lot of great food projects out there, feeding projects or training projects. And sometimes they don't have chefs involved in them. And you know what? That's, that's our living. So I think uh, keeping chefs in the middle of the food world in technology, we're involved in technology and how to connect farmers and food with, with school kitchens to, pre, to be producing healthy meals. Um, and looking at that strengthening of the economy by producing products and selling products internally. I mean, I, I urge everyone to keep in mind, yes, there's a lot of macro things to do here, but the future is really looking at local economies. We've been talking, how are we going to feed the world by 2050 and with the whole Feed the Future program? And small farmers keep rising to the top in this discussion. And I think you'll see that small production and, and supporting communities with smaller products and small production is going to do the same. So, um, you know, a thousand small projects can be just as effective and strengthen a, a country and change lives as much as one large project. Great. Sumito, yep. how are you? The same question. Mm. Um, we're ready. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going to speak in Spanish. You are asking me whether gastronomy can change the world and I'm going to start with an old story. When I was small, a young man, we didn't call your country Colombia, and didn't call me Peru. The first uh, words that came to one's was bomb, war, terrorism. That's what came to mind. Would you ask at that time to any young child about Peru, the first word that came up was ceviche, and that's happened in 25 years. That's if you ask people now. When people think of your country, Colombia, coffee, which gets so much advertisement throughout the world now in terms of gross sales it represents two percent of the economy of your country so you might wonder why you're investing so much money announcing something that is really just a minuscule part of the country because you talk about bonanza uh, uh, work and all of these values everything that have done through these intangible values of gastron gastronomy you build the idea of a nation and you build self-esteem. You cannot at any point in time talk about economic growth if the people that you're working with to try to achieve that economic growth do not feel that they are empowered and that they have self-esteem. Since 1972, we've been talking about intangibles, and just in 2003, they signed the agreements in which material, uh, cultural and material uh, heritage have been considered part of our uh, 
heritage. We've been talking about the intangible uh, heritage and uh, the world of culture is a world of intangibles. So 15 years ago, they asked me if you think, I had asked, do you think it's normal for the main uh, uh, product to be exported by your country is um, uh, folk dancing, and well, that, that's what tango is now in Argentina. But cooking is one of the intangible values, and perhaps one of the most powerful weapons to, in the very short term, achieve self-esteem, collective self-esteem. The video showed a lot of what was happening in Margarita, and it shows this. Uh, a genuine joy of the people who are now working with micro entrepreneurs with a lot of family businesses that we're supporting but there are hundreds of families right now who are on an island where there are 272 dates out of the 365 where these people can sell their products on the street so we're not just talking about business values which are clearly measurable but we're also talking about a lot of values that are much more much harder to measure and I and I come from the world of science. I was a ph um, physicist before I became a cook. I like to measure. I like to look at the numbers. And I feel that I have a project in which it's hard to measure this because the way I measure this is by shaking someone's hand. The people that you work with, people um, used to look down at the ground and give you a limp hand. Now they shake your hand like a business owner. And that's because this is a real product that we're helping them. So may I also speak in Spanish? whatever you feel more comfortable in. Yes, well, first of all, thank you, Anna, for inviting me. It was a pleasant surprise. And to be next to Sumito is also something very special for me because when I was a student, he was already well established, or he was older, let's say. And so I did even uh, go to work for you at one point in time. I don't think you remember me. But my main point is that we, like you, have a slogan within our foundation, and it's called the Melting Pot Foundation. And it's from Klaus Mayer, and we work with a group of Danish investors called IFU. And the idea, our slogan, is that we believe we can change the world through cooking. That's what, through cuisine, that's what we believe. And and to give you some of my own personal background, as Sumito started with his own background, I think that in Latin America, and we're just talking about our region, we do not have appreciation for technical careers. There is no love or admiration for these vocational jobs like uh, butcher, baker, carpenter, and cook. And that's what's changing in Latin America now. In my opinion, this is one of the major reasons that we have not yet been able to take off in our growth. And countries such as Germany and the Nordic countries do have a very strong basis of people uh, doing these technical or vocational jobs. And they have respect for them. My uh, story is that I was studying architecture and business administration when I became a cook. Well, I didn't finish any of those uh, careers or majors, but then I became a cook and my uh, grandmother in Bogota, because my mother's Colombian and I'm a Venezuelan, she called me up and said, listen, son, uh, you're a very nice kid, but you need to have a real profession if you want to do anything with your life. And I said, well, what can I tell you? And now, uh, uh, 10 years later, I'm here sitting down talking to you. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to respect these careers. We need to tap into the potential of these people. Latin America has an extremely young population that we need to empower. And we need to promote the industrial and manufacturing sectors because those people, these craftspeople who work in bakeries and uh, chocolate uh, manufacturing or fruit processing, that area has not been tapped into. In Latin America, we have no industry in this. We are simply uh, merchants and we don't know how to generate products. We know how to generate certain services, but not products. And we don't know how to export those products. So this gets back to you, Anna, about the manufacturing of these small products and we have to think of growing economically. So there's something missing here. And as you said, um, cooking is in the middle of this at the end of the day. As chefs, we're at the middle of this. We see the productive sector on one hand, we see the producers, and we see the food processors, and then we see the client and the service areas. We're in the middle. 
Exporting means not just exporting chocolate or good oil, but also exporting culture. That's what you were talking about. A motivation is that you export your culture and tourism, you attract people, and you also export information. I don't think that we've been tapped into. That's exactly what we were talking about. We are not respected as chefs, nor are we made, do they make good use of us. We know don't have enough um, communication capacity. Well, there are, there's potential for leveraging and um, communication. We need to tap into this. We need to make the pie bigger. We need to join efforts to see w which direction would be best to work in. So uh, that is essentially what I had to say. In addition to what you said, motivation is extremely important. Moment. And, and the, the game has changed. Uh, society has reached a profound tipping point in which technology and, and globalization are lowering the barriers to participation, making it possible for, for everyone to be a change maker, to access information, and to contribute more fully to society. And you are all very important change makers with very powerful and inspiring stories. Brian. Most people relate Haiti with poverty, with the 2010th earthquake, and with foreign aid. What was so unforgettable about Haiti that led to the establishment of World Central Kitchen uh, to help Haitians feed themselves? How exactly does it do that? I think what's most unforgettable about <clears throat> Haiti is Haitians, um, but the spirit that I get from the Haitians, I get pretty much everywhere I go around the world, but it's very strong in Haiti. You know, I think people want to be empowered. They want an opportunity before a handout. For the most part, I mean, we still have, um, you and I were talking about this earlier, we still have certain areas uh, which are free. There's this, you know, thousands of years of free. You can still get something for free. Um, but for the most part, I find uh, the Haitian spirit, really, they want an opportunity. They, they would much rather have, uh, get an opportunity to be trained and get a job um, or do something for themselves than be handed something. Um, I find that wherever I work, too. But it's very strong in Haiti. And World Central Kitchen works in three areas. We work in health, education, and jobs. <coughs> health. We uh, work in clean cook stoves, so right there we actually go to the kitchens of, of many schools. Last year we converted 100 schools to LPG. Now we were talking earlier and that problem doesn't exist in some of the countries, in some countries, especially Venezuela where gas is so cheap, right? We had this conversation. But I mean there's still a large percentage of people cooking with wood and charcoal in Haiti and in many other countries. And the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves will tell you, you know, four million people die a year from this, from, from effects due to cooking with solid fuels. That's more than, than HIV and malaria combined. So it's a huge issue. Um, but this is just, I mean, we go to the kitchens and, and one of the first things I notice when I go to these kitchens, uh, school kitchens in particular, because that's where we can have the most effect although we do work with homes, um, the principal will meet us at the school and he will say, the cooks are over there. And then I go find the cooks and there's a few, you know, two women like hunched in the back underneath the hut. And, and this is what I'm getting from Haiti and some other, and some other countries. They don't treat their cooks too well. You know, their cooks are kind of pushed to the back. And the meal's one of the most important things of the day. First thing I do is I embrace them, I take pictures, and I have my chef coat on, and I say, I'm a cook too. You can immediately see that, wow, you actually care about what I do for a living. You actually care about me. No one else has been caring about me. And then we come in, we clean their kitchens, and then we show them kitchen flow, and we do food safety sanitation training. Uh, we've been doing this all over Haiti for the last three years. Um, we got another large project coming up. We've done it in Nicaragua and Zambia as well. Um, but people want more of an opportunity. So some of the other things we've done is created social enterprise. We actually have a bakery and an orphanage in Haiti that's earning a profit, created five jobs, brought chefs from here. And this bakery is now turning a profit uh, for the orphanage. Uh, in Zambia, an, orf uh, uh, an organization saw that I had a bakery in an orphanage turning a profit in Haiti and asked if we could invest and do that in Zambia and that's how we got into Africa 
today they're baking 200 loaves a day, turning a profit. Not a big profit, but they're on their way to more profit. These are all small social uh, enterprise projects that people want. They want that opportunity. They want the skill. Um, and finally, we work in jobs where we actually have a full culinary school in Haiti. It's in uh, its fourth class, um, trying to work with the Ministry of Tourism to elevate the hospitality workforce as they increase their tourism, which we can do anywhere. We have it in three languages, and um, I think people really want that opportunity, and when someone of like-mindedness, especially cook to cook, says, hey, I'm, I'm with you, I work in the kitchen too, we're going to teach you how to do something new. You may, uh, I'm not here to teach you how to cook, you've been doing it for hundreds of years and I love your food. We're here to teach you maybe something new that can elevate you. People enjoy that. Uh, Michelangelo, uh, Gusto has, has the face of the Bolivian gastronomy and is considered one of the best restaurants of the region. But behind Gusto there is a very important social project, Manca Culinary School, uh, that provides education to socially disadvantaged uh, Bolivians as culinary entrepreneurs. How do you go about this task and what are the day-to-day -day challenges that you face? Um, it's all right. If I speak Spanish, sí, sí, claro. um, a ver, eh. daily challenges. First, what is manca? Manca was born. Well, it's just a seed that was planted in vulnerable communities in conflict that seek empowerment through education, employment, and the creation of commercial relations with their surrounding neighbors with products and services that can not only make schools themselves sustainable but also enhance the health of the people living around it that's the concept of manca where was it born it was born or at least the concept of nanka has been growing for quite some time it uh, first came about in denmark with my boss klaus mayer who is a danish gastronomical uh, entrepreneur who founded the best restaurant in the world and in Copenhagen they included cafeterias uh, within all of the Danish uh, prisons it was an agreement with the Danish penitentiary system and this inspired the idea of creating a school called Gusto within the restaurant Gusto and this was uh, founded by Beatriz Garcia we understood we were in, in the city of El Alto which is right next to the capital of Paz and we began to have these schools and now we have 12 of them just in Bolivia now we have one in Bogota and soon we're going to open one in Sucre Bolivia and also in Cali Colombia uh, the main challenges that we face is that since it's not a handout type of thing it's not an aid uh, organization we get donations or donations uh, 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 the support of uh, sponsors is very important to initially get it going, but the important for us is that each of these manka units be autonomous and sustainable vis-a-vis uh, -vis these products. I'm talking about bakeries, I'm talking about like granolas, uh, marmalades, um, cooking classes, but the challenges are what you said. It's to truly understand what social innovation needs, I, means. I think that's the first thing. And this merger between a product that supports the development of society but is also independent and sustainable isn't so innovative or unusual, but it's still hard to understand because either you're a social agency or you're a capitalist endeavor. So that's one of the biggest challenges, how to integrate this approach. That's what we're working on. But at the end of the day, the most gratifying thing about the Manka product uh, is the young people because they're the ones who get empowered by this and get motivated by this. At the end of the day, we go beyond just training people to be cooks, bakers, or restaurateurs, but rather to believe in themselves, to believe in their cooking, their culture, and their country. When you talk about Gusto, for example, Gusto has had a big impact on Bolivia. I think that it has been felt more by young people, uh, the one who shaped the Gusto school and the young people who work at Gusto, because of because they begin to believe in themselves, their products, and their country. There's no better fuel for growth 
than personal motivation and when you go there then you get your food that you prepared and that means that the entire manka process works better and it can be replicated in all of the countries not just Bolivia and Colombia but also in Cuba for example so empowering of local human capital is part of it and the use of local products as a means not only to create products but also to create pride is what has made all of the project very easy to do frankly in addition to all of the culinary training obviously there is a bunch of life skills values and entrepreneurial skills that help these young people uh, enter the labor market later even if they don't work as chefs or cooks and so we see that everything doesn't they aren't all necessarily going to work in restaurants but there is a training that um, really gets them ready for for the work world uh, tomorrow. How do you see the future of these young people? Well, the entrepreneurial uh, training is the most important thing about Manka. All of these units keep the system sustainable. And so they uh, launch enterprises and they they have to understand the market around them so that they can be sustainable. So these are kids who go out and look for a way to generate this. Obviously, they're not all going to be business owners. Some are going to work in restaurants, and they know how to find food establishments with the same values and principles that we use at Manca. That's part of the project. So these kids learn by practice. I, myself, am a chef, and I understood that the most important thing was practice practice at the end of the day. So you spend years or months working in Nomar Gaditz and that's uh, working there is like years of chef school. So you get practice and you come out with something that you can really apply in the workplace not only for yourself but also for certain spaces of society and to address certain business needs so without a doubt uh, entrepreneurialism is essential Sumito you went to uh, Margarita Island to work on gastronomy to create sustainable micro enterprises but also to continue building social capital and uh, trust in the island you talked to already about self-esteem esteem but how do you see that gastronomy helps bolster that pride and self-esteem and sense of identity and all of these things that are key for overcoming poverty and here I'm going to insert a little bit of politics and particularly in a country that is experiencing a very complex situation that we're all familiar with what's happening there well allow me to tell you a little bit about what has been happening in recent years vis-a-vis -vis these gastronomical um, endeavors in a, a conference like this I would almost say and because we talk about the region and Venezuela that's what it seems like at a meeting like this here we talk about the region and Venezuela uh, I've really been struck by that so when we look at the hardest part of the economic crisis in Venezuela, we see that the wages of some of a wage earner were not enough. And the people who tried to address this problem in on Margarita Island on the biggest scale were women. Women are the ones who always make the big decisions in terms of how is our family going to survive men are cowardly they try to get jobs and they 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 don't know how to get their own business going and historically i've always seen that women are immediately the ones who step in and address the problem like they've done in venezuela so they begin to sell things they sell uh cookies marmalades or a little uh pastry that they might make and there was simply a way to have a little bit of extra money in addition to their regular jobs but this began to really take off and fortunately in the case of isla margarita which is a very unique in venezuela right now it's almost a model in terms of management many organizations began to support these types types of um, entrepreneurial endeavors. There are universities that began to work with them, not only in terms of education, but to provide funding because this ex explaining financial principles. And there are lots of mayors that supported street fairs. And this 
uh, they quickly took over public spaces. A parenthesis here. This is a country in which all of the figures to have been uh, going in the red uh, or in the negative direction. More inflation, more violence, more um, poverty, and more. Um, Unemployment. I stress violence. I live in the capital of Margarita, which is a place that recently was totally unlivable because of all of the violence that you even found in the Bolivar Plaza and everything. And now there was a sense there in your uh, video of children painting because if you go on a Tuesday night, you find children painting in the plaza. How can you be a country in which the numbers are so negative? And when you have street fairs and you get the people who take over the public space and feel that it is theirs and they take ownership of it. And even though there's no street fair on a Tuesday, they feel that this is their space. But an important point here is the following. I am worried about something, and I'm just speaking personally. The situation in Venezuela is going to change. Thinking that it won't change, I think, would to be utterly pessimistic. But what does it mean it's going to change? We have to change, the, go back to the classic rules of imports. Uh, uh, but uh, we will have not hundreds, but thousands of people who are developing products uh, What's happening? We have these uh, empty supermarket shelves, but they need products. I produce something that's ugly, uh, mediocrely prepared with the label uh, that's not very within the natural patterns, but they're going to buy it from me just to fill the shelves. But even legally speaking, with is that, but when the new natural process of the economy occurs, and this is something after that uh, you have to, the economy determines how you have to do things. And once this starts, the owner of the supermarket is going to have the important product and this lesser quality product for, that was developed at those households in Venezuela that doesn't have a proper label. I won't buy it because I, I no longer am worried about filling up my supermarket shelves and I don't have all the tax regulations and everything and some this dizzying change that have were people taking over uh, public spaces which has been taking place consecutively for four years that's going to all get thrown out in 30 seconds in 30 seconds you would have this little marmalade that uh, that helped a family get by i'm not talking about not just women after her it's her her son her husband her whole family working on their product and i see uh, uh, that this has been very important. When you teach a family how to market these products, I'm talking about four things. You're achieving four things. Important cultural export. N nobody was familiar with Japanese or Italian cuisine unless they had put barcodes on their products. The Italian cuisine would have not have been recognized for the world if we had not uh, learned about the balsamic vinegars, olive oils, and all of their ingredients that they include there. When you export these products, you're placing a barcode on your culture. Oh, okay, sorry, I don't like to talk this way. The second point is you're talking about uh, entrepreneurial values. I was trained in the pri private enterprise. When you teach a family to look at their work and their occupation and that they can live with dignity and they no longer need the regular job that they had before, then you're instilling private enterprise values. You get self-esteem and you also have the takeover of public space. So what am I worried about? What's going to happen when imports start to flow into Venezuela again? What's to happen with all those uh, uh, local products? Enrique was talking about, excuse me, uh, for uh, uh, what I'm going to say about the CAF, but this is where CAF became an essential factor. We cannot, and excuse me, I'm obviously giving you um, a, a lot of publicity here, but we, we were business incubators, and if you develop businesses, we freely call in people, and we selected products that already existed that we consider to be the best. What do you mean the best one? Those are the ones that have the best chance of getting onto the supermarket shelves. Enrique has a family. They work with us. They have very tasty jelly made with local products, and it's uh, obtained close 
to home and then they work on this. But Enrique, excuse me, you cannot put your mom's name on this because it doesn't make for a nice label. I said, but it's my mom. Okay, we're going to work on it with the publicist. And then you begin to work on the product itself. Your jelly has to have a certain texture, but the people aren't going to, yes, they aren't going to buy it. They're going to buy it now because there's nothing else to buy, but wait till there's some competition. So this is a process whereby you're going to work little by little, and we've been discovering a lot of things. And I'll wrap up with this and there's a dream here the time may come when that family has a product that is truly ready for the market but to produce on large scale is very difficult for financial reasons and because up until there it's all been done uh, as a cottage industry at home and so we need to transform this space and separate home from commercial production so the second level of development after this is that we need to create space for this. I have land to do this, my own land. And we will create a production center. And now those families can come there and we'll do big marketing of these family brands of the products that they sell. And we're not going to miss the opportunity. We're going to have enough bankers that they uh, well, that's what the, but this is a process that you have to look at and experience. You have to work with people in their homes. And it's really astounding to see what's happening in Isla Margarita. It's really noteworthy. It's a situation in which we're talking about uh, 270 annual fairs that bring in no less than 1,000 people to each fair. I'm talking about two-thirds of the days of the year in which tourists can come and there are big avenues that get close to traffic and all of these families come in accompanied by different people including our foundation they introduce themselves and they've begun to pay taxes which is essential thank you hey, we still have half like two or three more minutes so let me turn to the audience and see whether you have any comments or reactions uh, if you have any comments, reactions, questions, there is one over there, two, three. Someone can help us with the mic. Yeah. Can I go first? Okay. What's your strategy on the farm to table movement where you work with local small producers of whatever it might be, pig, coffee, fruits. How do you get those into the restaurant on a regular basis? Me? Anybody. You're all chefs, right? Yeah. Well, are you kidding? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you were, I, got, I, I felt that like he was looking at me. I'm, like, I'm looking at you, Beth. Yeah. I have a restaurant, so yes. Sure. I don't have a restaurant. I can answer that. Um, uh, well, uh, basically, in Bolivia, we work directly with uh, NGOs like, for example, Wildlife Conservation Society or even ministers like the Minister of Rural Development. And uh, through them, we do uh, scouting of pro uh, producers, communities within the Andean area and in the Amazon and the valleys in Bolivia. And uh, we basically just contact them and start having a relationship with them. Uh, we have a producer code of conduct that we, we agree, which is basically use of uh, uh, things related about child uh, labor, uh, use of fertilizants, and these kind of things. So we can we, we know how we, we who we're working with, and um, and basically what we try to do is then bring in the products to Gusto or within the same company, the same small group in in Bolivia. We have a small transportation unit with two vehicles that we go there and we bring the products uh, from mostly areas around La Paz, like for example uh, Tiwanaco, uh, Yungas. Uh, in the road to Oruro and these areas. Uh, it's not a very cheap operation, it's super expensive. Um, it, it makes the entire company very expensive in Bolivia. It's sustainable, but it's very expensive. Um, but yeah, that's the way. We identify them through NGOs, we work with uh, corporations and associations in Bolivia. In Denmark, it's, it's much different. <laughs> it's a different uh, structure, infrastructure. Is a, a, a producer in Denmark is much well established. I mean, he's making more money than me. I mean, it's like, uh, this much more, it's super com comfortable. And uh, yeah, and in New York, the operation is, is younger, it's very, very young. So there is not, I mean, we're, we're still working on, 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 on scouting producer there. Yeah. 
Ryan, would you like to add something to this? Um, I think the farm to table issue is very interesting. Um, it brought to mind this whole concept of smaller or, or bigger. You know, five years ago, I think chefs that graduated the Culinary Institute of America, for example, they would have to go to New York or LA or Chicago to get a job. And, and then, this isn't about the product, but the farm to table thing has done so much for local community. Now, up and down the Hudson River near those schools, there are chefs focused on local product. They can open up a 60 seat cafe and make a good living. And when you open that restaurant, the community starts to come around it. So now you have small town America coming back. Look at Pittsburgh, it's got a whole new, uh, you know, whole new slew of restaurants there using farm to table, using all the farms right outside of the city. Was another question? So, uh, yeah. So my question is for Brian. Um, I would like to know uh, to give a big scope of recommendations for multilateral organizations and governments on how they can improve, how they can help and support agriculture in their countries. Because we know that there's no kitchen without food. Thanks. How do the? Uh, can you say that once more? How do the? Who supports the government, you said? Uh, multilateral organizations like World Bank, IDB, <coughs> and governments. Uh, how they uh, can, uh, if you can give a big scope of recommendations for them. That's a really good question, and um, I'm in a tough room for that. I'm completely privately funded. I have not funded this organization through any multilaterals or any World Banks or uh, <laughs> none of them. I mean, I, I actually really am happy that we're privately funded. It keeps us nimble. We're less than a million dollar organization. We're in five countries, 10 projects in five countries. Um, and we have 60, 70 chefs ready to go. And, and, and some, not just from the US. Um, that being said, I mean, I'm, will, I'm excited to expand and work with other organizations that come to know what we do because a lot of times you end up forming a project to fit someone's silo. I don't want to do that. I want people to eventually see who we are, what we do, and what we don't do, and then maybe there'll be something there that perfectly works out for both of us. Okay, and the last question over there. Sí, buenas. Muchas gracias ante todo. Thank you very much, and I thank all the panel members. My name is Alinda Her. I come from Venezuela, and I'm part of the Venezuelan American Leadership Council. Sema Sumito, I would like to uh, give publicity of Cap because I was a customer of this gentleman and with Chucho, and uh, indeed uh, his cheese, which is indeed very good. Uh, beyond that, uh, it is very positive to see that all these, um, all these micro enterprises are coming up and they allow, they give us breathing space and they give us hope in view of all the problems we see in our country and all the difficult situations people have to grapple with to subsist. I come from the state of Carabobo, a state in uh, Venezuela, where formerly we had over 50,000 companies. This number has been cut short for over 15 years now. And my question is, have you seen this effect that you see in the island of Margarita, elsewhere in the country? Do you think that it can be replicated? And if the political situation in the country should change, would we be able, I wonder, to stimulate all that entrepreneurship capabilities, not just in tourism areas, but elsewhere in the country? We got country because it has to do with a model, a paradigm in which we're working. And uh, at this point in time, I had a great blessing. And this is that uh, CAF, in one way or the other, is uh, financing the possibility that we may have a statistical framework, 52 families, this is, that is, to understand from that statistical base where are the pros and cons and the figures to generate the managerial model. But my commitment is to generate that managerial model because I'm sure it does exist. There is such model that can be replicated elsewhere in the country. But I think it is a model for management in region by region. We have detected where the needs are, what is it that a family requires, when does a family feel um, under threat, 
uh, we have gone to homes and we have learned a lot there but in response to your question and in just 30 more seconds something that I was telling Anna yesterday where you cook in your house perhaps you don't have the minimal uh, sanitary preconditions for a product to qualify to eventually reach a shelf at a store once you go into a home and you start separating things even if it is within your own home it is very difficult sometimes to maintain those good practices we have uh, realized and it's very interesting that we start having different levels uh, we are at a stage now where the main uh, lawyer's office in the country and as part of its social liability program will be associated with our foundation in order to work with uh, all of the legal elements uh, required to have trademarks for each one of these projects and we're funding that but for these families to truly have access to that second stage wherein monies are being given and some attorneys at law are working primary inspections have to be carried out to make certain that the good practices are being applied. And uh, once this uh, is realized, we know what is the percentage of people participating. We uh, know that the attendance to all the workshops we offer, it's 100%, but it went down to 60 some percent. Now it is 72% attendance to each one of the workshops with all the people involved. But we've been able to raise that attendance because we have been learning along the way. But those figures become managerial levels often.